Hey everyone, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the different object types available in Blender. So in our 3D viewport, I'm going to hit Shift A to bring up my Add Object menu. The most common type is the first one in the menu, the mesh. Under the mesh, you're going to have several default items that you can choose from. These are all just starting points. Many people will start with just a plane or just a cube, but generally speaking, you want to start with the shape that most closely resembles the thing you want to model. For this example, I'm just going to add a cube. Most objects in Blender act the same way as each other when they're in object mode. You can move them with the G key or the move tool. You can rotate them with the rotate tool or the R key. And you can scale them with the scale tool or the S key. Where they differ is what happens when you go into edit mode. You can go into edit mode a couple of different ways. The first is by going up to the mode menu and selecting edit mode. Also, hitting the tab key will take you from object mode to edit mode. Hitting control tab will bring up a mode pie menu where you can select many of the different modes available. In this case, I'll just choose edit mode. Meshes are made up of three basic components. Vertices, which are the points, in this case the corners of our cube. Edges, which connect those points with lines. And faces, which fill in the space between multiple edges. Edit mode in Blender has three sub-modes. Vertex select mode, where you can select individual vertices. Edge select mode, where you can select individual edges. And face select mode, where you guessed it, you can select individual faces. Meshes give you a substantial amount of control and flexibility in your modeling, as every point in space is available for you to put a, a vertex, and you can connect any two vertices together, you can connect multiple faces together to create what you're looking for. There will be more videos here in the future on working in mesh edit mode and all of the tools that are available to you when you're in that mode. Next on the list is curves. There's actually several types of curves available to use in Blender. The first, that when we go into edit mode, you'll see at each point of the curve, it has a, a pair of handles. Each point on the curve has a center point of their handle, which indicates its location and then it has two subhandles, which change its rotation. Another type of curve is the circle. This is a Bezier circle, and so it still uses the same type of handles that our Bezier curve did for control. Next is the NURBS curve. NURBS, which stands for Non-Uniform Rational B-Splines, are actually controlled by a cage of points rather than the handle controls like in a Bezier curve. Similarly, the NURB circle works the same way, except the path is closed instead of open on the end. Finally, paths work much in the same way as NURBs, except the endpoints of our curve are connected to the endpoints on our path. Paths are great for animating motion paths and other types of smooth movements. Curves also have the ability to have geometry set on them. In this case, a bevel can be added to a curve, turning it into a tube. One of the nice things about using a curve for this type of object is that it remains fully editable. Whereas if I created this shape with a mesh, it would be much more difficult to edit it later on. After curves, we have surfaces. Much in the same way that NURBS curves use control cages to control the shape of the curve, NURBS surfaces use control cages to adjust these objects. So for instance, a NURBS surface is really just a three-dimensional NURBS curve. Next in the list are metaballs. Metaballs are a fluid-like object. 
and when you combine multiple metaballs together, their shapes flow into each other. While this is not a fluid simulation, it can be used to make fluid type shapes. As its name implies, the text object allows us to add editable text into our scene. By going into edit mode, we are able to change the text like we would in a word processor. By default, the text is a flat plane and always editable with the tab key, like a curve under the object data properties tab menu of the properties viewport, we can add an extrude to our text to give it thickness or a bevel to the edges to give it some rounding. And in this way, we can turn it into three dimensional text. In addition, we can go to the font sub menu and select any fonts from our system to use instead of the default blender font. because everybody wants some Comic Sans 3D text in their scene. One bonus item on text objects is the text on curve option. One bonus item to use for our text is the text on a curve option. If we add a curve into this scene, and then with our text selected, use the eyedropper on text on a curve to select our curve, we'll see that our text now follows our curve directly. And we can edit this curve as we want Next on the list is the volume object. This allows you to import open VDB files, which are generated by other programs and may represent something like an, a model or a fluid or smoke or clouds or some other type of object. Here's just a sample file that I downloaded from openvdb.org. While it may not look like much right here, this is actually a model of some smoke. And not only does it contain this information, it contains other information that can be visualized, like the heat of the object, the density, or other types of things which can be used in rendering and deciding on its materials. Grease pencil objects are Blender's entry into the 2D animation area. Grease pencil objects allow you to draw into your scene in a two-dimensional format and then treat those two-dimensional drawings as a three-dimensional object. Check out this video hero from the Blender Institute that showed the power of the grease pencil object. The next two objects, armatures and lattices, are two ways of controlling other objects. An armature is a bone structure that allows you to create a rigid skeleton for your object and drive it using that. Similarly, we can adjust an entire object with a cage using a lattice. If I just bring in this little character I've got here, and I add a lattice, we can surround this character with the lattice. And then giving the lattice subdivisions, we can then parent the object to the lattice. Now, when we edit our lattice, we deform the entire object in relation to our changes to the lattice. If you've ever seen the children's series VeggieTales, 
especially the early episodes, you'll notice that most of the animation was done using lattices. Now while that program wasn't done in Blender, the same concept applies. Next on the list are empties. Empties are ways to create objects with no actual renderable information. We can place them on our screen to connect items to, to have as markers, or even to hold images as references. There are multiple shapes depending on what your need is. So anything from a plane axis to a cube to a sphere are all the same. Next are images. There are two types of images you can bring into your 3D viewport. The first is for reference. For instance, this scene here is now contained within an empty. I can put this into my scene, scale it, move it, rotate it, and I can use it as a placeholder for other things until I need them. This is really handy if you're going to want to model something and have several images of it right there in your viewport, right next to what you're modeling. Next we have lights. Lights are one way we can illuminate our scenes. We have four types of light objects to use in Blender. The point light, which shows light in all directions. The sunlight, which shows light in one direction very directly. The spotlight, which shows light in a cone. And an area light, which shows light from a shape. To demonstrate a few of the light types, I've made a simple scene. First, I have an area light. As you can see, I can make it longer and thinner. I can make it smaller but the basic shape of the light goes into the scene. Next, I'll change to a point light. As you can see here, the light radiates out from a central point, much like a dome light in a living room. Finally, is the spotlight. The spotlight shows out a cone of light, like a spotlight in real life. We can also use the tools in Blender to change the cone size, for our objects. Next are light probes. Light probes are a more advanced topic when using the EV rendering engine to get more accurate lighting in your scenes. Also, they're used to get more accurate reflections in your scenes. Next, cameras are the objects you use to look through in order to do rendering for your scenes. If we have one camera in our scene, that will be our selected camera. We can place it into our scene, hit our tilde key or backtick key, and go to view camera. We can also click the camera icon in this navigation box. And then we're looking through the camera. If we point our camera at our object, we see we have it there. Now, if I go ahead and add a second camera, and add it and move it to a different spot in the scene. You'll see if I go to my camera view, I go back to my first camera. That's because this camera is marked as my primary camera. You can tell that by in the outliner, the camera icon will have a little box around it. That indicates that that camera is the one that's active. You can change that by just clicking the camera icon next to one of the cameras that will change that camera to the active camera. And now when you go to camera view, you'll see that camera. The speaker object is one that I haven't ever actually used in a project, but I can see its uses. It allows you to add sound to a scene, and then depending on where it is in three-dimensional space related to the camera, it will place it in your stereo mix in the same place with a relative volume to how far it is from the camera. In this way, if you had somebody walking past a radio, it would get louder as they approached and then it would fade away as they walked away. Force fields are empties that you can add into your scene that will affect physics simulations that you might have later. So things like smoke simulations or cloth simulations can be affected by force fields. Finally, is collection instances. 
Here I've created a collection called Pillars of Three Cylinders. Now, if I go ahead and hide this collection by shutting it off and return to my main collection, when I go to my Add menu and go to Collection Instances, you'll see that I have an option of adding any of my collections into this scene. So I can now add my Pillars collection as an instance. This places a copy of that collection in my scene, but you'll notice that it's not editable. If I want to change these objects, I have to go back and change the original. So if I turn my pillars back on and edit one of them, you'll see that the instance reflects those changes. And I can have multiple copies of this instance in my scene. One of the nice things is behind the scenes, Blender uses less memory if you use instances of objects rather than full actual copies of those objects. So any time where you have the same object replicated many, many times, it's a good idea to use instances. So that's a not so quick rundown of the object types in Blender. I hope this overview is helpful and gives you an idea of some of the things that are available to you as starting points for making your models, scenes, animations, or whatever it is you're doing in Blender. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, click that like button. And if you would, please subscribe below. That way you'll be updated of any new videos when they come out. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.